Hey, good morning. Good morning, church. And thank you for joining us today. And if you will stand and we'll sing Death Was Arrested.
Lord's good, amen? Great to see you here in the house of the Lord today. Let me ask you a question this morning. I want you to consider this today, those of you that are watching us and those of you that are here. Why did you come to worship today? Why are you here? You could be anywhere else, and some people are other places right now, and they should be in the house of the Lord. But why are you here today? I hope that you can say that you're here to worship a risen Savior and that Jesus is alive. Amen. I'll give you another chance there to say amen. All right, ready? One, two, three. Amen. All right, very good. If you're here for any other reason than to worship Jesus, let me tell you this, you're here for the wrong reason. It's not about how many people are here. It's about worshiping Jesus. Now, we want to see people come to worship the Lord. But we have to make sure that our hearts and minds are prepared to worship the Lord so that this week we can go out and serve as we have worshiped. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. It's a privilege and honor to be in this place of worship. Lord, there's no other place that I would rather be than among the people of God in this place worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would transform lives today, that people would be changed because of who you are. Lord Jesus, if there's anyone in this place that doesn't have a personal relationship with you, that they would surrender their life to you before it's eternally too late. And Lord, how sad it will be for those that missed opportunity after opportunity to hear about you. But how much more it would be as we think about those that hear and reject. Lord Jesus, give us ears to hear, hearts and minds to comprehend your truth so that we can live out your word. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated here for a moment. Now, I'm going to get to this in, a, in the message, but aren't you thankful for the air conditioning and the electricity that we have today? Amen. Yes, some things we take for granted until... We don't have it. And so we want to appreciate what the Lord is doing in our lives today as we worship him. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all
away my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God
fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God so my
do you feel like you just can't handle anymore? Do you feel like you're just so overwhelmed by all of our circumstances that we're dealing with now? I have some good news for you today. There is a brighter day coming. And you're in the best place to be this morning to hear about the goodness of God. So take your Bibles and find Psalm 107. I'm going to ask if you would stand as we read God's Word this morning. And I want you to listen very carefully and ask the Holy Spirit to teach you what He wants us to learn today. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His mercy endures forever. Listen to verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And gathered out the lands from the east and from the west. From the north and from the south. Verse 8. Oh that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. And for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 15. Oh that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. And for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 21. Oh that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. And for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 22. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And declare his works with rejoicing. And then verse 27. They reel to and fro. And stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits' end. Verse 31 Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 32 Let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your powerful word and how it speaks truth into our life always. And help us to hear clearly today what you would have us to hear. And Lord, those that are watching us, just allow the Holy Spirit to speak truth into their life. Help them to have their Bibles ready and willing to hear from you. Those that are in this building today, Lord, help us to do the same. As we listen to what you would have to say to us, encourage us, strengthen us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated here. I've given today's message at wit's end. At wit's end. Some of you, I know just from talking to you, that you seem like you're at wit's end. As we have conversations about what's going on across our nation, many people are fearful and afraid of all the circumstances that we are facing. But let me encourage you this morning that no matter if you're at your wit's end, there's hope in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, this passage of Scripture that we have, it is seen as a national religious service. The keynote speaker is joy. And I want you to understand that there is joy in the Lord no matter what our circumstances are. No matter what we face. And listen to me carefully. When joy speaks, you had better listen carefully. Now, I think about this in our, in our own lives. I think about a, a national service that we had in America. I can recall a service in my own life right after September the 11th. When the Twin Towers were bombed and there was a national service and I would say in my own personal estimation, the keynote speaker wasn't the President of the United States. The keynote speaker was Reverend Billy Graham. The nation wanted to hear what our great evangelist to the world and what the preacher of the gospel had to say in times of difficulty. And I would say that there were many people watching and listening In the life of our nation, I would say there was much unity. 
after we saw those twin tires bomb. But I want you to know, even in our nation today, we see mass destruction. We see buildings being torn down by our own people. And we wonder, where did the unity go? Why aren't Americans, North Americans, citizens of the United States of America, coming together in unity during these difficult days? I want you to know that should cause us to be concerned. But I believe if we look to the promises of God, we know that the goodness of God is what helps us through the storms of life. It's his goodness today that allows us to experience all that we have. And the children of Israel knew a lot about difficulties. In Ezra chapter 3 verses 1 through 3, we see that perhaps this psalm was composed for the first celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles after the return from exile. You remember they were carried away in exile. They were in bondage. But when they received deliverance, they were excited and encouraged about what God was doing in their life. I tell you, sometimes we have dark days. But if our hope is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, there's always brighter days. Because our hope is in the Lord. Now our hearts, even this morning, should be overflowing with thanksgiving. Overflowing with thanksgiving. And here this morning, I'm going to lay out for us, based upon this psalm, some recognitions or reminders of things that we should keep in our hearts as it is overflowing with thanksgiving. First of all, as we think about it today, we want to understand the goodness of God. This is the duty of praise. This is what Melanie sang about in the song today, the goodness of God. And when we praise him for his goodness... It takes our eyes off of our circumstances and it puts our eyes exactly where they should be on God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You see, when people are looking at circumstances and they're not looking to the goodness of God, that's why oftentimes they can get discouraged, they can get disheartened because of everything that they're looking at. But when we are reminded that praise is our duty, we understand this, God is good. Now, let me tell you this. Do you know why he is good? Sometimes we will make that statement, but we don't really understand why he is good. And so this morning, I'm going to tell you why he is good. His divine attributes make him good. It's his character, it's who he is that makes God good. First of all, we will see this. It is his benevolence. Benevolence. Benevolence means to promote happiness. Now, don't you understand that especially in these days and times, we are very sensitive creatures. It seems like people are offended at the drop of a hat. Why are people so easily offended today? I believe it's because if they're not careful, they can wear their feelings on their shoulders. And we are sensitive creatures. But when we know that God's plan and purpose for our life is to promote happiness, we live a life with enjoyment. I want you to think about it this morning. Are you living a life with enjoyment today? Or you say, oh, preacher, I am too stressed to be blessed. Or would you say, I'm too blessed to be stressed? No matter what our circumstances are, when we look to God and his goodness, we have no reason to be fearful and afraid of what's going to happen in our nation. Even though we're supposed to be the salt and the light in this world, we rely upon the goodness of God. And when we know that he wants us to, to be happy, we know that we are undeserving of God's love Yet he loves us, and because he loves us, we should be happy. Let me tell you this. There's no greater joy than knowing that God loves you in spite of who you are. When you understand that God is love, my friend, you don't show up to church looking like your best friend just passed away. 
You show up to church to worship a risen Savior who's on his throne and he's ruling and reigning over the universe and Jesus loves us. And my friends, that carries the day knowing that Jesus loves us. Now your grandchildren may love you. Your children may love you. Your spouse may love you. But there's nothing like the love of God. Nothing like it. Turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. Listen to these words very carefully. Write them down in your heart because we need to know how much God loves us today. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Let me tell you this. The Bible says that Jesus became the propitiation for our sins. That means when he was on the cross that God's wrath was being poured out upon him because of your sins and because of my sins. My friends, no one deserves to go to heaven, but only those that trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior will go to heaven because they recognize the love of God. You didn't wake up one morning, friend, and say, Hey, God, I love you. You woke up one morning, and if you said, God, I love you, it's because you recognize that he first loved you. Now, why did he love you? Because you're so lovable? Because I'm so lovable? Oh, no. No, I could stand up here today and tell you why you're not so lovable. I can tell you why I'm not so lovable. But it's by God's love that we experience the joy that he has in our lives. If people go around and they are humped over, looking like it's the end of the world, I would question whether or not they truly know the love of God. Because God wants us to find this enjoyment in Him. And let me tell you this, with God, you are completely satisfied. Completely satisfied. C.S. Lewis said this, our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures following about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine it is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea we are far too easily pleased. Let me tell you this. If God says, all you need is me, why do people turn to alcohol? Why do they turn to sex to try to find that enjoyment in life? Because oftentimes they will find out that that will leave them empty and discontent. But when we turn to God and he gives us his joy, then we realize, hey, in God, we are entirely complete. We have his joy. This morning, are you joyful? Are you excited about what the Lord is doing in your life? I'll tell you, when you just recognize that he's at work in our lives, you have that joy. And people ask me sometimes, they say, how can you just be so joyful? What is it about you? I say, well, I'll be honest with you. We try to keep our focus on the Lord and our attention on Him, and that makes life easier when we're looking in the right direction. Secondly, we see that God is love. It is His desire or delight in rational beings. It is an attribute of love that reveals who God is. And God is love. Now, how many of you would say this morning, I, I'm still in love with my spouse. Would you say amen to that? All right, get those hands up. Get those hands up. You'll be in trouble. You'll go home this afternoon and you won't be able to eat and you'll have to sleep on the couch. If you don't say God is love and you love your spouse. God is love. Do you understand that today? And God has always been in love with us, and no matter what we do, he's not going to fall out of love with us. 
Wow. You know, you, you take a couple sometimes and, and one of them will wake up one morning and say, I'm no longer in love with you and so I want to get a divorce. You know what they're oftentimes saying is my feelings towards you have changed and I'm no longer having that sensation that I've been eating chocolate my whole life and chocolate gives you the sensation of being in love. Men, I've said this before, but it's been years. You know what gives men that same feeling of being in love? You know what it is? Wolf brand chili. <laughs> With no beans, and it gives you heartburn sometimes. So you got to be careful, men. But when it comes to the love of God, God is love. God's love in us allows us to understand God. Listen to this again in Psalm 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures, how long? Forever. And then listen to this. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Now, my friends, the redeemed are those that are saved. We are to say that God is love. We are to share with people that God is love. I'll tell you this. You just listen carefully. Most people that are redeemed today talk more about the things of the world instead of the things of God. We're missing opportunity after opportunity. Somebody brings up the virus to you and they say, well, we don't have a cure for the virus. You say, oh, yes, we do. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the great physician. He can cure the sins in our lives. And the Bible says he has washed them away with his blood. That's the cure. You say, oh no, preacher, that's not the cure. Yes, it is. Jesus is the cure for all disease, all sin. Jesus is love. And know this. God's love in us allows us to fellowship with God. Now, we love to fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, right? We love to be around them. But let me tell you this. There's nothing like fellowshipping with God. Nothing like it. When you wake up in the morning, you fellowship with God. And listen to me. It's not a monologue that we have with God when we're praying. It's a dialogue. We let him speak to us about his love. And we tell him how much we love him. And as we pray and we seek after him, we say, Lord, now what do you want me to do with my life? And you have to listen very carefully. Because that fellowship with God, there's nothing like it. And we rejoice because God is love. Uh, let me tell you this. If you go to a church and they're not rejoicing about who Jesus is, you probably need to find another church. You rejoice because God is love. He loves us. He cares for us. And we lift up the name of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, if you lift up the name of Jesus, he will draw all men unto him. And I'll tell you this. We rejoice because God feels our hurts and pains. Turn back just a couple of pages to Psalm 103, verse 13. Psalm 103, verse 13. The Bible says... As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Verse 14, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Now, I want you to think about this. God feels our hurts and pains. He knows that we're simply but dust, but he cares for us. He loves us. And next time you get ready to take your shower, and hopefully you took one or a bath, but if you didn't, under our circumstances, it's understandable. Amen? Oh, go ahead and say amen. It's all right. But I want you to remind yourself, when you're scrubbing your skin, you're putting that soap on it, it's nothing but dust. Nothing but dust. Our bodies aren't meant to last forever here on this earth. But only what we do for Christ Jesus will last forever. But God knows our hurts. I know that some of you in your pews today, you're hurting, you have pains, but God knows your hurts and pains. The Bible tells us that Jesus is our great high priest. Everything you go through, he has experienced in his life. You've been hurting lately, you have pains, he knows, he loves you. 
He wants you to know that you just lay your burdens on him and he'll take care of them. And then also know this. God is good because he is merciful. His kindness is exercised towards the miserable. He shows pity to others. He's compassionate. He is gentle. Lamentations 3 verses 22 through 24, it tells us that his mercies are new every morning. Every morning. And that God is always faithful. Now let me tell you this. People are not always faithful. Uh, They'll give you a promise. They'll break a promise. They change from day to day, from week to week to month to month. People are fickle. One day they're hot for Jesus. If they're not careful, a month later they'll be cold. But God is always faithful. Always faithful. You can trust him. You can count upon him. His mercies are given to us. It's his kindness. And how many of you realize that it seems like in our nation today, kindness is missing? Watch how the elderly are treated. Watch what they do to people that they should be respecting, but they dishonor. What happened to kindness? You see, God is merciful. He gives us kindness. Even though we're miserable, we are pitiful, but he loves us. And I'll just be honest. Some people are more miserable than others. But God loves them just the same. And then know this. God in his goodness, he provides grace. Grace is ascribed to God. It's his love towards us because we are unworthy. Who does grace go to? It goes to the sinners. And let me tell you, every person in this building, those that are watching us today, we're all sinners. You'll sometimes hear people say, well, well, they're the the salt of the earth. They're a pretty good old boy. They're a pretty good old girl. No, we're all sinners saved by the grace of God. None of us deserve the grace and mercy of God, but God is good. And he gives us his grace and mercy. It's a mysterious attribute to his divine nature. Why would God love us when we're so unworthy? Let me tell you what a lot of people think today. A lot of people think, hey, I'm pretty good. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't committed murder. I'm a pretty good person. Let me tell you this. None of us are worthy of the grace of God. We are all unworthy. We don't deserve what we get. And so when we get something, it should surprise us because we don't deserve anything that is good. You say, oh, yeah, preacher, if I don't get what's good, I'm going to demand it because I'm entitled to it. Oh, we live in the entitlement culture today too, right? We say, hey, I'm going to get it, and if I don't get it, I'm going to demand it. And and if I don't get it, I'm going to cancel it. We'll we'll do something different because I don't like it. But listen to this. Let me tell you, we oftentimes get things that we don't deserve. When Billy Graham was driving through a small southern town, he was stopped by a policeman. He was speeding. And he admitted that he was speeding, but he was told by the officer that he was going to have to appear in court. Now, I want you to get this picture in your mind. One of the greatest evangelists to ever live, missionary to the world, in a courtroom because he was caught speeding. The judge asked him, guilty or not guilty? Reverend Graham, Billy Graham, said, I'm guilty. The judge replied, then that'll be $10, a dollar for every mile that you went over the speed limit. Now, some of you, the way that you drive, that would be quite expensive. But that's a sermon for another day. So suddenly the judge recognized the famous minister. And he said, you have violated the law. He said, the fine must be paid, but I'm going to pay it for you. He took a $10 bill from his own wallet, attached it to the ticket, and then he took Billy Graham 
out and bought him a steak dinner. Praise God. And Billy Graham said, this is how God treats sinners that repent. Have you repented of your sins today? Have you trusted in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? You see, if Billy Graham could be caught speeding and sinning, we all can be caught sinning. But it's only by the grace and mercy of God that he treats us the way that he does. So listen to this. God is infinite. He is eternal. He is immutable, which means he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Dr. Wayne Grudem said about the goodness of God, it means that God is the final standard of good. And that all that God is and does is worthy of approval. My friends, God doesn't need our approval. But we say to God as we praise him and say, God, you are good. You are worthy to be praised. God, you are so awesome. And so it changes our perspective. Now, who is good? Do anyone want to say today, would anyone like to say, hey, I'm good. I'm a good old boy. I'm a good old girl. You know what the Bible says in Luke chapter 18, verse 19? No one is good except for God alone. Correct people when they say, that's a good person. That's a good boy. That's a good girl. There's no good, not even one, except for God himself. And that's why some people, you have to convince them that they're lost before they can ever be saved because they think because maybe they went to church, maybe they joined the church, maybe they were baptized, maybe they shook the preacher's hand, they're pretty good, and so now they're going to heaven. No, the only way to go to heaven, dear friend, is to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and to trust in him as your personal Lord and Savior. Psalm 106, verse 1, 107, verse 1, give thanks to the Lord for he's good. Sometimes the only thanks we give during the day is when we're praying over our food. But we can thank the Lord always because he is good. Thank him for his goodness. Thank him for his grace. What is good? Whatever God approves is good. Whatever he approves. You say, well, I put my stamp of approval on it. That was a good message today. That was good. The truth is, it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God thinks. Always. God's approval is what we should be seeking in our lives. The psalmist made it very clear. There is no higher standard of goodness than the character of God. All that God does is worthy of approval. All that he does. You remember his creation, Genesis 1, verse 31. God created the universe and he said it is good. It is good. Now today we know that the creation is influenced by the fall. That's why we have tornadoes. That's why we have hurricanes. That's why we see mass destruction because of sin. And the earth is cursed. Because Adam and Eve in the garden decided they didn't have to keep one commandment of God. They decided to do it their way instead of God's way. And so we still deal with the results of it today. James 1.17 says that God gives the best gifts to his children. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. You sometimes think, we sometimes think, well, I paid for that gift. I gave that gift. Hey, my friends, if God didn't make that gift good and he's not the one that allowed you to be able to have the resources to be able to give it, you wouldn't be able to give anything. All gifts come from above. So start thanking God for all those good gifts. And then listen to this, Psalm 84, verse 11. God gives only good things to his children. I want you to think about it from this perspective. You think I would give my children, Reagan and McKinley, something that would bring harm to them intentionally? No way. I want them to be protected. I want them to know that they're going to be safe when mom and dad are looking out for them. And so it is with us as God's children. 
He gives us good gifts. All the good gifts that we have come from Him. So how do we praise God? Why do we give Him thanksgiving? 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In all of our circumstances, good, bad, and indifferent, we praise the Lord in all of our circumstances. What would you think about somebody that only praised God in the good times and not the difficult times? You would say they're a spoiled child, right? You would say of your children, if they only praised you when you gave them good gifts and not when they were going through difficult circumstances in life, something's wrong. But listen to this. God gives us happiness when we are holy. Leviticus 19 and 2, 1 Peter 1 and 16 God desires for his people to be holy because he's holy. And let me tell you this. Holiness is always connected to happiness. When you're living like the world and you're committing sins and you're living in a lifestyle of sin and you're not happy, ask the Lord to help you become holy as he's holy. I hope that you realize today he expects us to be holy because he's holy. That means we approve of what he approves of. That means if God disapproves of something, we disapprove of it. We don't try to excuse it or say it's okay. Now I want you to, as you think about this today, as a way of application, listen carefully. Think about the good gifts God has given to us. Think about the good gifts that he's given to us. Write them down. Let me just give you a way to write some of these things down. I went to church today, and we had air conditioning. Praise the Lord for that. I went to church today, and we had lights. I went to church today, and the preacher preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He did not compromise. He did not hesitate. He did not back up. He preached the truth of God's word. I'm thankful that my family are safe and secure. I'm thankful that more people were not killed by this storm. I'm thankful for the goodness and grace of God. I'm thankful for his love and mercy. I'm thankful that I have a place where I can come and worship in freedom. And we can say that we live in the greatest nation, one of the greatest nations in all the world. Hey, listen, I could go on and on. We would be here all afternoon and all night and maybe all week, all month. You say, oh, preacher, I don't know if I can do that. When you understand who God is and all that he's given to you, you can praise him because he's worthy to be praised. He's a God of goodness. And so, as we close today, I want you to think about this. The Bible says repeatedly throughout this psalm, let me read it for you in verse 15. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. He's working in the life of his children. He gives us great works. All that God has done for you. And are you still complaining? You see, when your heart is not where it needs to be, you will complain about all the things that you see because you're not thinking about the goodness of God. Don't be complaining. Don't be grumbling. That's a sin, dear friend. And that shows in many cases that you're not thinking about the goodness of God. Because if you think about the goodness of God, you realize you don't even deserve the air that you're just getting ready to breathe. God is good. The goodness of God gets us through the difficult moments in life. And dear friends, you can trust him in all of your circumstances. You know why? He's good all the time. And all the time, God is good. How good is he to those that love him? Better than we deserve. Dear friend, as you're in this place of worship today, I hope that you understand that God is goodness. That's not going to change tonight. It's not going to change tomorrow. He is absolutely good. And his mercy endures forever. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus before you leave here today, surrender your life to him. Listen to me carefully. Religion is not going to get anyone into heaven. 
only having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you say, well, preacher, I'm not sure I believe everything that you're saying. Well, you go back and you study it a little bit more, and I'll ask that the Holy Spirit will teach you this truth, reveal this truth to you, and you'll start living life differently. You appreciate everything that God has done in your life and in my life. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, before it's eternally too late, dear friend, surrender your life to Him. It's the best decision that you'll ever make. You'll live life differently here on this earth while you have life because you'll live it for the glory and honor of God. You'll seek His goodness. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is love, and that's why He sent His Son. He sent His Son to die for us. And when we receive Him as our personal Lord and Savior, we live for Him we love him. Our life is changed because of who Jesus is and what he's done in our life. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for the privilege to serve you. We thank you for the truth of your word that speaks into our lives. And help us, Lord Jesus, to realize that even though it may appear that we are at wit's end, we know that God is good all the time. And all the time, Time, God is good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to stand now. The reason that you're standing is not to get a little exercise. The reason that you're standing is so that you have an opportunity at the first word of the first stanza to step out and do business with God. God is his goodness and he loves you he cares for you and today do business with him and you'll never regret it as Melanie plays you come and do business with the Lord I'll be standing right here waiting for you as you come may be seated the Lord's good amen thank you for being here today I know that for many of us it can be a challenge at times because of what's going on and there's still people in our parish here that don't have electricity and so we want to pray that they would get electricity sooner rather than later right 
Man, y'all, y'all weren't excited about that. Y'all must have electricity. If you don't have it, you're praying for it. But listen to me. There's nothing greater than the power of God. When you know his power, you have everything you need. When you know who God is, you appreciate more who he is. Tonight at 6 o'clock, our evening service here at First Baptist, it is the Lord's Day. So we'll meet here tonight, and uh, afterwards we'll have a meeting. And then just to make you aware of this, we do have our tickets available up here at the front for our men's event on September the 15th. And after church tonight, we'll have a meeting about that. And so if you want to be involved in that planning and process, come. And this is what I need you to do, and I'll be listening. We want to make sure everyone's encouraging people to come hear this great message that we're going to hear that night. It's going to be a great message. It's about a a young man that lived in our area here, and then something happened in his life that his father's going to share about. Uh, that lives not too far from here. And so we want to get the word out so that people can hear the gospel and be saved. And then also, Wednesday night will be our evening service. And then tomorrow night, just so you know this, at First Baptist Bossier at 6 o'clock from 7 to 30, we're going to be praying for spiritual revival for our nation. We normally meet here, but we're going to go there because people from across our area, across our state will be there People from other states will be there as we're praying for spiritual renewal. And I'll be leading one of the prayers tomorrow night. So be there at 6 o'clock. It'll last to about 7.30. And then, something else we need to know about. Today has been set aside. And tonight we're going to spend more time praying about this. More intentional prayer. But Bubba, tell us about what today is in relation to First Baptist Robilene. All right. 